it's it's very precious how how much you don't realize we take for granted when we see everybody every week but then one member when a member is not here then we're like we know we don't have to have a formal writing out of it we know that that member is missing we know they're not in the in, a, in the fold with us and that's how much we should care for each other is the same as Jesus I think of whenever he was given his last instructions to the disciples and the prayer before he would be offered up you know he he told the Lord that I have not lost any except for the one that was set apart for destruction he knew he cared intimately about his children that were placed, the father's children that were placed in his care. I want to deviate to food. David will like this. <laughs> Man after my own heart. <laughs> but, uh, and not the kind of food you're thinking of. Yeah, I know the food's back there being prepared and we don't want to mind on it. But I think of that, is it, was it a parable or story where the little Indian boy and the father were watching the two wolves fighting. And the little boy asked his father and said, which wolf is going to win? And uh, you would think he was going to give some elaborate explanation. And the father said, well, it's the one you feed, the one you nourish, the one you strengthen. So which do we feed? Do we feed the warrior inside of us? Or do we, do we feed the flesh, the enemy's warrior? You know, you think of when we stumble and fall and we wonder why, and I know, I know it's in our heart to always please the Lord, but none of us are perfect and we stumble every day. If we, if we did a checklist and honestly graded ourselves, we would know that here's the mark and I've fallen all these times. It'd get discouraging if that's what we did. If we looked at how many times we faltered, how many times whether we let our temper get the best of us, whether we were coveting something we weren't supposed to, whether we were spending more time in front of something, wasting our time than what we should. It, we would see the measurement up here and we'd see us way down here and we'd get depressed and we'd, that leads to us giving up. We should never look at that. When Peter looked around at the storms, he got discouraged and immediately he sunk. But as long as he was focused on the standard, Christ, Nothing faced him. He was victorious. Even in the midst of the storm, he was victorious. So if we feed the spiritual man, the spiritual warrior that's in us, we're going to have less times to look back on and feel ashamed of falling short. We're going to have less times of brushing the, the gravel off of our knees and doctoring them up and standing back on and trying to carry on. You think of King David and you... See where, when he was a young man, he faced down Goliath with no qualms, didn't even have a second chance. He even stood against the king and his family. Not in a disrespectful way, but basically, he was letting them know your eyes are on the flesh. You, king, should know that with us serving the Lord, that that giant is no match for us, as he knew as the lion and the bear before. But what happened to get him to the point that he wasn't leading his men at war. What happened to have him in the luxury of the palace and to where he ended up sending with Bathsheba and we see the, the vast things that he did there that you would never have thought reading the first part of David's life he would have ever even cross your mind that he would even entertain, much less do. And it's because somewhere along the line he quit feeding the spiritual man and he started allowing his flesh to be fed. The, the riches of being the king, the privilege of being the king, instead of reading in his word that was in his pocket that he was commanded. Obviously, if he was reading, he wasn't reading what he should have been reading. And I would hazard to guess he wasn't reading daily. He wasn't being faithful, because if he would have been, he wouldn't have stumbled. He wouldn't have fell short. If we feed the carnal man, if we allow people to appeal to our flesh or things to appeal to our flesh, to where we put that before God, then we're going to be defeated. We're going to constantly be in that state of shame, of feeling like we've let the Lord down and constantly not, not overcoming our obstacles. He didn't promise us a rose garden 
to where we'd be carried on a little float. He gave Satan everything. He gave him the, as Lucifer, he gave him the right under God himself. There was no one that had the blessings to Satan. He gave it to him just freely. And look what Satan did with it. Now, do you really think that he's going to give us the precious sacrifice of his son and not expect us to be diligent, to try? He looks for that heart. Even when David sinned, he, had, he knew that David had a heart after him. And all he had to do is be made aware of where he was at. And he would rekindle that fire afresh and start serving the Lord. Philippians 4, verse 4. These preachers out here, I'm not going to call them shepherds because they're not shepherds. But these preachers out here that push the message of appease your flesh, get riches to yourself, prosper yourself, they're making shipwreck of God's children because that's never going to last. If that's, the, if that's the position you have, that's the very character of our enemy. He wanted for himself, so he tried to take God's throne by force. And it, like Michael has pointed out in our Bible studies, and I think he's mentioned it a few times in the messages he's given, he wouldn't have been satisfied with that. Once he, if he would have been able to have uh, obtained that position, he would have turned on those closest to him, those ones that helped him get there. We look at Hitler, what Hitler did. He got with appeasement what he could, and then he started turning on everybody that helped him get there to the point that it all crumbled. That's the character of Satan, and that's what is being pushed out here. We should be self-aware. Don't, don't, don't offend me. Don't, don't you dare judge me. It's all about your person, the person of you, the almighty you. It's what it's about. Verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God will surpass all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. That's a clear-cut instruction of what we should dwell our minds on. If... If we do and imitate Christ, when he was on this earth, he was all about his father's business. At the age of 12, now you think, well, that was disrespectful. He basically told his mom and his earthly father, hey, I got things to do. You ought to know this by now. You know, but that's not what he was saying. He was fulfilling the ministry that he was called. And it may look from the fleshly point like we're rude or we're some weirdo or whatever, but if we have a heart after our Heavenly Father's business, it's not going to matter what this person thinks. It doesn't matter if they think we're a fanatic or weird or, or drunk like they thought they were at Acts, you know, in Acts when they received the Spirit and they thought, well, they're drunk. And, of course, it was so early in the day that it made it foolishness to even think such a thing. But people, that's the push, is to have... And there's going to be so many leaders, supposed leaders, that's going to have a stiff judgment upon them because they should have been more concerned about the souls of the person rather than their feelings. And they're never going to be victorious. Those people are never going to be victorious if they're feeding the flesh and not feeding the spirit. You know, most Christians symbolize their commitment to God by baptism, which is, means that you are dead and Christ is raised. You shouldn't be trying to resurrect the flesh. And that's what it's doing. When you start starving the spiritual and staying away from the word, prayer, devotion to the Father, His truth, whatever it may be on this side, and you start focusing completely on oh, how I feel or I don't want to 
I want to be buddies with this guy over here, and if I say this, he might think I'm a crazy fanatic, so I've got to muddle the words down so I can keep. Well, what good is it if you're both going to hell? If you're, if you're keeping him from salvation, then you're on the way with him to destruction. Galatians 5, verse 16 He says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh, flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, Impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envyings, drunkenness, carousing, and these like, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, they wouldn't receive what Paul had to say. They wouldn't receive what Christ had to say. If they were here now in person, the probably 98% of supposed Christians out there would think that these guys are haters and judgmental and bigots and whatever else because that's the very message we're trying to put forth and we're attacked for it. That's why Christ said, "If you know you have part of me if they hate you because they've hated me first. And it's not you that they're hating, it's me in you, is what he said. Because they're, they're feeding on the flesh and they don't want to starve that man. He's gotten such a hold that you have to do it. That's why sometimes it's not easy. You can't just be nice about something. You can't just very carefully touch on something when you're talking to someone. Sometimes you just have to lay it out there bold to get their attention because they fed this, this fleshly person, this deceptful person so long that their spiritual eyes are blind. They're not going to see it. Verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. That's what Jesus meant by you carry your cross. You pick up a cross and follow me. This fleshly person, who I am in the flesh, is dead. Now, granted, we have to keep putting it down because it keeps trying to rise back up, but the, the more we're lax in feeding the spiritual, the more it's going to rise up and take a hold. And eventually, we're not going to realize that the spiritual man is sick. That's why we can't live on milk. We live on steak. No, just kidding. <laughs> steak and dessert. <laughs> Cars and sandwiches. But... <laughs> that's an inside joke for the Bible study I was trying to give an example and I said you know you need cars and sandwiches so now that usually comes up every Sabbath <laughs> but uh, you know one of my sisters here knew I didn't need dessert so she let me carry in a salad so <laughs> that's love <laughs> my taste buds don't think so but that's love anyway back to reality uh the spiritual man is very important that we take very cautious care of it. We need to strengthen it. We need to subdue the things that are going to weaken it, make it sick. You know, Christ, the sacrifice he gave for us, the things he endured through his ministry, but there at the close of his ministry, it's too precious. It's too precious to rob him. And, and I think of Michael's training. You know, if, if you don't have a training, if you don't keep practicing it, you're basically beating a dead horse. You're just going to stay in that sore mode where, where you beat your muscles down, and every time you go to do it, they're not, they're, they're not being built up because you're not being faithful with it. You're doing it once in a while, and you're just going to stay in sore and misery. It's not going to benefit you in the long run. But if you're faithful with it and you, and you endure the pain, and that's what it is, is pain management. Spiritually speaking, this is pain management. Do we want to have to turn away from brothers, sisters, mothers, whoever in this world. No, we want to be accepted. That's our fleshly person. But if we're going to follow God, we may have to do that. It's not ideal, but it is necessary at times. 
It says, in verse 25, it says, If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And closing up in Romans, Paul gave so many, so many crucial instructions to the different churches. And we know it's not Paul, that it's actually the Lord through Paul. Paul was just his, mess, his tool at that moment. But it was for the early church, and it's for us now. So many people now don't even want to listen to anything Paul has to say because then they're going to have to be accountable because Paul doesn't mince words. He lays it out there. And that was no mistake. God choosing certain instruments, John, to, to do 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, Revelations, and the book of John, or Paul, to write what he wrote, or Peter, or James, they were fairly fine-tuned for a specific purpose, to reach certain points. Because he knew what we were going to face ahead of time. He knew that the early church was going to have to deal with those that were trying to go back into Judaism. He knew that they were going to leave to the point that by Third John, he couldn't even write to the church without people being banished from the church and removed from the church. The last living apostle after Christ. That's how short it spiraled downhill. How much more so now after all these years. Chapter 8, verse 23. And not only this, but we, are, we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. How many people here want the fight to be over? We want the carnal man to be done, the sin nature in us to be removed or we don't have to battle. If you truly love the Father, and if you truly love the Son, you hate the things that you do. Like Paul said, I do the very things I hate to do, but it's not me, it's that carnal man that's still trying to raise itself up. We have a very, very crucial job to make sure we don't give it any, any leverage upon us. We shouldn't feed it. We have to fight it anyway. We shouldn't give it any strength because we're not going to win that fight then. Verse 24, For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for that which he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance... We await eagerly for it. We have to persevere. It is a fight. It is warfare. People that want to say the Christian walk is paradise on earth, they're deceiving so many people. They're plonking them on the front lines and telling them, oh, they're not really got real bullets over there. They actually like you. You just got to get over there and be friendly with them. What kind of... How much love is that to send somebody out there in that, in that kind of condition? You know, once they meet the enemy that hates their very being, the very cause of their... We are in the, in the very likeness of God. Satan despises us. And we've been granted through Christ the thing he tried to take by force. So how much more hate is there on top of that? This is not a cakewalk. This is open warfare. We have every once in a while, we have a reprieve, especially in this country where we have some freedoms of religion. We can meet here without having to worry about the doors getting kicked in and our lives being threatened. But make no mistake, we're in warfare. If we get luxury, you know, if we are lulled in complacency by, because we're not being threatened, our lives aren't being threatened, our loved ones aren't being threatened, then we're fixing to get taken down because the enemy is sleeking in their very very craftily to take us unawares. We need to be very vigilant. Praise God. Lord, we worship you today. Yes, we worship